الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اما بعد اي الحبت في الله continue on in our study of this very important issue of ruling by other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed we discuss many things in the other two parts of this series regarding ruling by other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed we discussed in the first one about the hukum or the ruling of ruling by other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals and we said it's muharram and that it can be both the same action can at times be kufr al-akbar or kufr al-asgar that it can take one out of the bowl of Islam as the major disbelief and sometimes it is the minor disbelief but still a major sin and then we discuss a little bit about the status of the ruler of the one who falls into the sin and a little bit about the issue of takfir and this last discussion with regarding to these masail because these are three different masail if not more that have to do with this very intricate and detailed issue <clears throat> this last portion or last discussion will be a little bit about the conditions for khuruj or the conditions of when a leader is declared as a disbeliever when do you rebel and when do you not rebel because this is also what distinguishes ahlus sunnah from ahl bid'ah and that ahl bid'ah they make takfir without the conditions for takfir being in place and even if they declare takfir on someone who is a disbeliever they believe in khuruj or rebelling and during all circumstances and you'll find that even they believe that the leader that is oppressive should be rebelled against and his authority should be usurped and this shows another important distinction between ahl sunnah and ahl bid'ah and that the salaf rahimahumullah jami'an that they had reached consensus there were times when Im uh, imams of the salaf had win against the rulers that they either but in those situation none of them were khawarij but they were rebels that they had made their issues of ijtihad and they were incorrect in that but after those times the salaf of this ummah had come to the consensus of the impermissibility of rebelling against an oppressive ruler and so these issues have really been settled in the books of fiqh and the books of hadith the explanations of hadith and by the great imams of the sunnah throughout time however those people who are infected by the cancer of takfir either being fully khawarij or ibadiyah or those people who are just affected by aspects of their creed are still propagating this and encouraging people to rebel against muslim authorities and oppressive muslim authority imam muqbil bin hadi al wadi allah yarhamahu will begin with his one of his statements because now we when we talk about khuruj or the conditions for khuruj against the leader we have statements of the salaf but as far as the intricate details coming from kitab was sunnah and the salaf this comes from a lot of those masail come from the latter day generations because perhaps although the salaf had to deal with those issues but generally 
they were dealing with clearly it was Ahlul Sunnah versus the Khawarij or the Mu'tazila or the Rafa, the Shia and other groups that believed in rebelling against the Muslim authority. But now we have many Hizbi groups, Akhwan al-Muslimin, and many other groups that, and ideologues that propagate go against, going against the Muslim authority. Or just making takfir without the right to do so. So, these issues have been detailed in Imam Wadi. He mentioned five conditions with regards to rebelling against the ruler. The first, He mentioned the first thing which comes directly from the hadith we already mentioned is that the leader has fallen into clear, undisputable or indisputable disbelief that we have proof from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning it's completely unambiguous. What they're doing takes them out of the fold of Islam and it is clear and there's no room for debate or uh, ambiguity. That's the first condition. So it can't be something where the, that the Salaf or even later generations had differences of opinion with regards to whether this is an issue that takes a person out of the fold of Islam or not. It shouldn't be something ambiguous. And likewise, even the condition of this ruler, it shouldn't be ambiguous whether or not, because the asal is that he's a Muslim and he stays upon Islam unless we have something clear in which takes him out of the fold of Islam. Clear. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that in the hadith, uh, that you find kufr from him, uh, kufr and bawaha, that would be, uh, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, illa in taraw kufr and bawahin indakum fihi min Allahi burhan. So that's the first condition. The second condition of rebelling against a disbelieving ruler, remember this is, we're talking about disbelief, we're not talking about an oppressive sinning, sinful ruler. Because we've already stated that no, you should not. Because the Prophet ﷺ said in that very hadith, because they asked the Sahaba, they asked about the uh, oppressive ruler. And the Prophet ﷺ said, no, unless you see open, indisputable uh, disbelief from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that the, this, this evidence is clear from the Qur'an and clear that Allah has made it manifest and clear that this person has left the fold of Islam. <clears throat> Number two, the second condition is qudra ala izalatihi. This is very important. Is that, that you have the ability to remove that disbelieving leader. So for example, Syria is an excellent example. Iraq is an excellent example. And Somalia, all these contemporary... Uh, conflicts in many of the Muslim lands illustrate this beautifully and unfortunately that many times even if the leader had left the fold of Islam and it was clear but the people rebelled without the ability to do so or a non-Muslim power intervened or it was their war in the first place like in the case of Afghanistan in the case of Iraq were the United States and uh, the other coalition forces, they, as disbelievers, had taken over and killed uh, uh, this disbelieving ruler, Saddam Hussein. They had removed him from power. And look at the folda and chaos that has resulted from that up until now. Now we are in 2015, and the people in Iraq generally still do not uh, sleep and still their children cannot safely go to schools in many parts of Iraq uh, you know it is stagnated the economy and the society as a whole and the growth of the society why one of the reasons they didn't have the ability to remove him and replace him with that which is better the third thing 
على تنسيب مسلم مكانه and this is the third condition so I actually overstepped the bounds but the sheikh himself referred as his third condition the ability to put another Muslim in his place somebody who is who is uh, munas who is uh, befitting of this role so that you replace him with something better that is a Muslim and the fourth thing على يترتب على هذا الخروج مفسد أعظم من مفسد بقال كافر. This is beautiful and this is an important Sharia principle. All these are are Sharia principles. ولو كريه الأهل بدع. Even أهل بدع, even though they hate this, they hate listening to principles. They will come up and say, where did this come from? And we'll say, well, كتاب الله وسنة الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم. And understand the Salaf, the Fuqaha, this Ummah, they're the ones who looked at that. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala Himself Subhanahu wa Taala في in the Quran mentions that you have to have the ability that Allah doesn't hold you responsible for that which you are unable to fulfill. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is out of His mercy. So the Shaykh said that removing the leader does not result in a worse, something more evil, a greater evil than the evil of him staying in his place. So for example, under Saddam Hussein, who was a wicked tyrant, disbeliever, Baathist, communist, there was stability in his society. And it kept the Rafa, the Shia, in place as well. But after the removal of him, even as a wicked shaitan he was, the Shia team gathered together. Now it, uh, Iraq is a, a, a Rafa, the stronghold, basically. And then the Takfiris from all over the world have congregated and are going wild and killing and slaughtering people and putting bombs at festivals and bombs in Masajid and this and it's just and, and it's become a fitna for Ahl Sunnah that has remained there as well. So it's nothing but blood and uh, chaos is the result. Why? Without the, the ability to remove the leader and to put someone who's better in his place, a Muslim leader that's better in his place. And the wickedness resulted from removing him is greater than uh, 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 the wi the wickedness of removing him is greater than the wickedness of him staying in place, perhaps. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows best because the people of Iraq have not seen the peace and stability they were promised by America and these other uh, uh, powers. They haven't experienced that, and the war was built based, based upon a lie. But those are other issues. Uh, predicated on a lie, the weapons of mass destruction, his cooperation with Al Qaeda, and all these other uh, fantasies and and fabrications, which were used to uh, advance their their uh, goals. But these are other issues, which are outside of what we're discussing. And the fifth thing, Imam Mukbil, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, mentioned. Al istighna al adati. So I had to go to uh, some other to search for what he meant by this. That basically he is he means he is saying that they are free from needing uh, disbelievers to assist them. So this is a a shark that Imam Mukbil himself. Uh, uh, by looking at the nusus from his ijtihad, that uh, you you should not you should be totally free and independent of needing uh, disbelievers to assist you. Whereas other ulama of Ahl Sunnah hold a different view with regards to this issue, and they bring their evidence. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows best. So those are the conditions. Here's what Imam Ibn Hajar al Asqalani rahmatullahi said. إذا وقع من السلطان كفر أو كفر الصريح فلا تجوز تعاته في ذلك بل تجب مجاهدته لمن قدر عليه لمن قدر عليه uh, إمام ابن حجر الأسكلاني رحمة العليس صاحب الفتى الباري he said if the leader has fallen into clear disbelief, then it is not permissible to obey him. 
in that. Rather, it's an obligation to strive or fight against him, whoever has the ability. Whoever has the ability. Again, whoever has the ability. So Imam ibn Hajar, rahmatullah is not saying that when a, a leader does something wrong, commits an error, or that he uh, is sinful, or he's talking about the one that has left the fold of Islam. And then, with those other conditions, that the maslaha, that there's more maslaha than mafsada, that is more rectification than mafsada. And this is clear from uh, the imams of the sunnah with regards to this issue. From the modern day ulama as well, is the statement of Imam Ben Baz, and we'll try to synthesize it because it's a very long statement, but I found so many benefits that I really wanted to read it, so we'll try our best. Uh, Imam Ben Baz, he said, إِذَا رَأَى الْمُسْلِمُونَ كُفْرًا بُوَاهٍ عِنْدُهُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ فِيهِ بِرْحَانٍ فَلَا بَسْ أَنْ يَخْرُجُوا عَلَى هَذَا سُلْطَانٍ لِإِزَالَتِهِ إِذَا كَانَ عِنْدُهُمْ الْقُدْرَةِ أَمَّا إِذَا لَمْ يكون عندهم القدرة فلا يخرجوا أو كان الخروج يسبب شرا أكثر فليس لهم خروج رعاية للمصالح العامة والقاعدة الشرعية المجمع عليها أنه لا يجوز إزالة الشر بما هو أشر منه بل يجب در الشر بما يزيله أو يخففه أما در الشر Bishar Akhtar Fala Yajuz Bi Ijma'al Muslimin. This is a, a powerful, very important uh, statement which sums it up perfectly here about this issue. Imam bin Ba'ad said, he said, if the Muslims see that uh, open disbelief from a, uh, where the proof is from Allah and it's clear and indisputable, then no problem with going against this, that Sultan to remove him, that, that leader, that wicked, uh, disbelieving leader. If they have the ability, so then he's mentioned in that first condition. As for if they don't have the ability, then they should not uh, rebel. Or that this rebelling is a reason for more evil than, th than they should not, it's not permissible to uh, rebel, meaning if it's a greater harm in doing so, then of course you don't do it. This is a Sharia principle, and this is even a, a general life principle that many societies adhere to. That you take the the easier path, and you take the path which has the 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 least harm in it. When you weigh out policy, they don't say, "Well, this is going to harm us the most." They they look for that which is going to give them the most benefit with the least amount of loss. And then he said, he said, uh, so then they should not rebel. And this is to, uh, in order to safeguard and rectify the general rectification of the society. To safeguard the general society. And then he mentions this guy that we've been talking about. Very important. He said, al qaida shari'iya al mujma This is a, a qaida, this is a sharia principle which has consensus, which is agreed upon by the fuqaha and the imams of the sunnah and the imams of deen. He said, أَنَّهُ لَا يَجُوزِ زَلَةَ الشَّرْ بِمَا هُوَ أَشَرْ مِنْ That it is not permissible to remove something harmful or something wicked with that which is more wicked than it. Rather, it is an obligation to uh, avoid the evil or, 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 or remove the evil with that which will remove it and make it less. So that's what Islam calls us. This is Sharia fiqh principle. And then he says, as for the, uh, you know, removing harm with a greater harm, then this is not permissible by the consensus of the Muslims. Allahu Akbar. Then the Shaykh brings all kind of other fawa'id, and I'm not sure, I don't want to take too much time, I'll just try to translate it without reading the Arabic, because it's going to take a long time. So he said, and if this group, which wants to remove 
this, uh, you know, this evil leader that is a disbeliever, that has done clear, open disbelief, and they have the ability to remove, uh, to remove him. Uh, then they should replace him with a righteous imam that is uh, upon goodness without that uh, causing uh, uh, a wickedness and, and a great wickedness for the Muslims. Meaning that there shouldn't be spilling of blood amongst the Muslims, killing the Muslims. You're not sure if he's Muslim or not. It's just bloodshed and it's, it's, it's revolution and all the harms with that. And he says, He said, and, and as long as there's not a, a evil, which is greater than the evil of that leader, then no problem. As for if uh, rebelling is going to cause a greater harm or greater wickedness and remove the sense of security in society or stability, and it's going to be in, uh, a cause oppression on the people and invite to killing those people who do not deserve to be killed. And other than that, from wickedness, from great wickedness, then this is impermissible. Bel yajibu wa sabr wa sab'i wa ta fil ma'roof wa munasaha wa la tal umur wa da'wat al lahum bil khair wa al ijtihad fi takhfif al shar wa taqlilahu wa takthil al khair. That is a powerful statement. So he said that uh, after we mentioned the, the other things he said, so it's not permissible. He said, rather, it is an obligation, meaning if those conditions are not in place, then it is an obligation to be patient and hear and obey in righteousness. Because even if a disbeliever, and I don't care what society you're in, if you're the, the person over you calls you to that which is in accordance with the Sharia, it's an obligation for you to, to, to obey that. Regardless if it's a policeman in the UK, regardless if it's a president of the United States, regardless of whoever, if they call you to ma'ruf, ma'ruf meaning that it is goodness in the Sharia, it's based upon Islam, it's Islamic, something that is in agreement with Islam, then you must obey the leader in that. Because he's calling you to, the, to obey Allah and his messenger. Even if he doesn't, he's unaware of that. You must obey that because it's righteousness. You must do righteousness. It's wajib. And then he said, and, and, and advising the uh, Muslim, uh, the leader, and supplicating for him with, in goodness, and striving to uh, lessen the harm and the evil and, and spreading goodness. So those are some of the obligations and those are some of the conditions. And the last thing we'll, we'll mention is uh, the statement, one of the statements of Bin Othimim, but his statement is actually very much in accordance with what we've already said. He just breaks down the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and mentions those same conditions. And he mentions the hadith uh, uh, that, that we already mentioned, and he breaks each of those terms down as a condition. He says the, the, uh, the first condition is that you see disbelief. That we see disbelief. And then another condition, that it is uh, clear, open, a shart that he mentioned. And that we have proof from Allah, you know, that we have uh, clear, indisputable proof from our Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he mentioned the other condition, Arabia. He said he mentioned that as the four conditions. So that it's in accordance. And then he brings the other tafsil, which we've already mentioned. So it's not necessary to repeat it, especially because our time is short. Those are just some of the issues with regards to this very important issue. And we ask Allah the Almighty to bless us with good and forgive us of our many sins. And spread khair and goodness throughout the land of the Muslims. And rather, throughout the world, for there to be stability based on Kitab Allah wa Sunnah of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala bless the Muslims to be a guidance and a source of light for all of mankind. 
to see us as people who are people of security and people of stability, to want to come under the protection of the Muslim, to want to, uh, uh, to, want to become Muslim and worship Allah Azza wa Jal alone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the Muslims everywhere with stability and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me for any mistakes that I made uh, with regards to this and all of my sins. And may Allah bless us with all good. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.